Welcome to Hard Talk on the BBC World Service with me, Stephen Sacker. My guest today is a veteran diplomat who currently finds himself in a very sensitive spot, defending a government accused of putting short-term national interests above collective strategic considerations. Mehmet Fatih Jalan is Turkey's ambassador to NATO in Brussels. He has to explain to Western colleagues why Turkey refuses to become an active participant in the U.S.-led military coalition against the so-called Islamic State extremist movement. The issue is particularly pressing right on Turkey's doorstep. IS fighters have spent weeks laying siege to the Syrian Kurdish town of Kobani on Turkey's border. Ankara has massed tanks and troops nearby, but they've done nothing to aid the Kurdish defenders of the town. Why? Well, Turkey's critics suggest it's part of a pattern. The Turks, they say, have long offered tacit assistance to the Sunni militants in Islamic State because it serves their wider objectives, namely the destruction of the Assad regime and the reigning in of Kurdish freedom fighters. So there is now intense pressure on Turkey, not least here at NATO, to do more to confront Islamic State. But is Ankara ready to listen? Well, Turkey's ambassador here, Mehmet Fatih Jelan, joins me now. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Let us start with the situation around Kobani, that small town on the Syrian border with Turkey, which has been under siege from Islamic State fighters for the last few weeks. Mortar shells have even been landing on your Turkish territory as they fire at the Kurdish defenders of the town. Why have you done nothing to aid the Kurdish defenders of Kobani? At the outset, let me share my frustration uh, with the picture being depicted about Turkey, that Turkey doing nothing about uh, Kobani, which is in our opinion, extremely uh, misleading. But we have seen that you have forces very close to the border, you have tanks, military personnel, you do not use them, you have for weeks blocked Kurdish fighters from crossing from your territory into Syria to join the fight to defend the town. So what is it you're doing? First of all, uh, about these shellings. Indeed, there had been shellings by uh, ISIS, And these were responded uh, by the army because uh, the army has rules of engagement, uh, which was established or rather reinforced a long time ago in the face of the Syrian crisis. With regard to Kobani, I mean, Kobani is only one location where ISIS is uh, committing its atrocities. And let me emphasize once and for all that ISIS is a clear and present threat to Turkish national security. And I start with Kobani because one UN official, the envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistura, likened what is happening in Kobani to Srebrenica. And he said, we must not forget what happened there and we must not let it happen again. I come back to the same question. Why does Turkey stand by and watch? In Srebrenica, uh, I was in NATO then, and I remember very vividly what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The United Nations Security Council took a decision to establish a safe haven in Serebrenica, whereas we do not have one uh, for Kobani or for any, for any other location, either in Syria or Iraq. Now, let me, uh, your question, part of your question was why we are not allowing Kurdish fighters to go to Kobani and fight the war. We have our own citizens of Kurdish origin, some of whom would like to go and fight in Kobani. That's correct. But my, my, my question in the end is, is, is really quite simple. Are you prepared to let Kobani fall and still continue with the policy you have right now? If anybody expects Turkey to act unilaterally uh, on Kobani or somewhere else in Syria or Iraq, uh, I think uh, that is not a fair expectation from Turkey. But but with respect, it's it's, it's not unilateral, is it? I mean, we see the U.S. airstrikes. I believe in the last uh, week or so, they've launched more than 100 strikes in the Kobani area. Right. You wouldn't be acting unilaterally. We, there is a U.S.-led military coalition That's right. which and is trying to help the Kurdish fighters. We you have made it. a choice not to join it. Look, I mean, we did uh, provide uh, certain uh, logistical support to Kurds, and we sent 60 trucks to Kobani. 
and we are in touch with all the local uh, players. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you continue to say that Turkey is doing nothing in the face of Kobani, I think that would be uh, very misleading. Well, Mr. Mr. Ambassador, <laughs> let, me, let me quote to you words from your own government officials, who several of them have said that what is happening in Kobani is simply a fight between two different groups of terrorists. They appear to draw no difference between the Kurdish fighters trying to defend the town and the Islamic State militants trying to take the town. Do you personally see it that way? It is true that there is a uh, terrorist organization there, but we cannot uh, say that all Kobani people are terrorist people, which is also applicable in the case of my country. I mean, there's what we have PKK uh, as a terrorist organization, but that doesn't mean that PKK represents all the, Kur you know, all the Kurdish people living in Turkey as Turkish citizens. But aren't we getting to the truth of it now, that your government has a paranoia about Kurdish militancy, and you are so concerned about the possibility of a Kurdish entity establishing itself in northern Syria and links between the party behind that entity and the PKK, that you are actually quite happy to see Islamic State taking on the Kurds and killing the Kurds. Well, let me uh, re-emphasize then that, uh, first of all, we don't call it Islamic State. There is no such a state. And uh, ISIL or ISIS uh, does not uh, represent Islam. It's a threat to Islam. It's a threat to our national security. You, you, you yourself said, and this is why I'm puzzled by the stance your government takes, you said just the other day, IS, ISIL, whatever you want to call it, is a big threat to Turkey and no doubt one of the biggest challenges we are facing since the end of the Cold War. Correct. Those are, those are your words. I, I, I didn't only say it. That was on the occasion of uh, NATO Secretary General's visit to Turkey. Our uh, government well, spokesman... <laughs> I'm asked if you really believe that. Yeah. Turkey's current strategy is nonsensical. See, but the point here is that we, we need to uh, uh, have a, a, an integrated strategy. Uh, I should remind you, the number of the total refugees accepted by the EU countries, the total is 123,000 or 124,000. So can you imagine that we are receiving 200,000 people without any discrimination uh, in the case of Kobani. Well, and nobody would dispute that Turkey has been under enormous strain because of the humanitarian catastrophe that has right. come across your border and you've had to deal with it. But the fallout is very serious for your country. I mean, you're the ambassador here at NATO. You have to work with uh, partner countries in this military alliance. And you must be more aware than I could ever be that the Americans, for example, are deeply frustrated with the stance your government has taken. And in fact... Just after your president, Mr. Erdogan, declared that there would be no military assistance for the Kurdish defenders of Kobani, we saw American C-130 transporters dropping supplies, including military equipment, to the Kurds in Kobani. So there is a real rift now between Turkey and the United States. I don't believe so. We are in deep consultations with the United States. Uh, General Allen went to Turkey twice. Uh, he was there when uh, NATO Secretary was there, and he held extensive consultations with all our political leadership. And certainly, uh, we have to develop a, a strategy which is clear, integrated, and holistic, uh, not only to address the Kobani, what's happening in Kobani, but throughout uh, the area, including uh, Syria and, and Iraq. Otherwise, th there should not be any unilateral action that's expected from Turkey. Because unilateral actions are always risky. If you're now concentrating on Kobani, just imagine that Turkey goes it alone and uh, intervenes in Kobani. What would be the repercussions for Turkey? ISIS is a threat. It killed 82 Turkish citizens. And in 2003, we suffered from uh, terrorist att attacks in Istanbul by uh, Al-Qaeda. For over four decades, uh, we have been suffering from uh, terrorism in Turkey as well. Now, this is a transnational threat which cross borders and which requires international uh, activity and in international effort. Well, you, you, you say we need to coordinate. Let us just be clear then, because uh, there have been messages from Turkey suggesting you will now allow Kurdish fighters to cross your border and go into Syria. So can you confirm that? Well, what happened is that we are in touch with all the local, uh, local peoples. 
including uh, Mr. Barzani. And we are doing our best to help uh, Kobani people to defend uh, the city. I mean, you cannot simply come to the conclusion that Turkey is, is doing nothing. Uh, well, you, you've made that point. The irony is that while your military has not taken decisive action across the border in Syria, your military has been in action bombing your own people, Kurdish people in southeast Turkey. There is supposed to be a ceasefire with the PKK. It's been in operation for, what, two years or so. Which bombing are you referring to? Perhaps? Bombings last week in which your warplanes attacked two bases of the PKK in Where? Hakkari not, province. Not in Turkey. Not in Turkey, right? Uh, this most was in probably Hakkari in, in, province. In, in Iraq, most probably in Iraq. It did happen, yes, uh, because in our clear assessment, uh, PKK is a terrorist organization. Not only uh, PKK is a terrorist organization for Turkey, but it's also a terrorist organization for the European Union, uh, for the United States. So there is a kind of uh, binding commitment uh, by our allies to continue to fight uh, PKK as a terrorist organization. And So you are more concerned right now about the threat posed by the PKK, with whom you are in peace talks and with whom you have a ceasefire, than you are with Islamic State, which you've said to me represents the greatest security challenge since the Cold War, but you're doing nothing about it. It just seems a very strange set of priorities. But ceasefires are established between states, uh, not between a state and a terrorist organization uh, like PKK. Uh, so I wouldn't uh, agree with you uh, on using the term ceasefire. There are efforts, serious efforts in Turkey not recently, but over the last uh, couple of years, to try to settle this, this issue. And I think over the weekend, the prime minister came together with the wise man, uh, and he consulted exten extensively uh, with those people, trying to settle that Kurdish issue uh, in our own country. Now, it's, I wouldn't even call it a Kurdish issue, but it's a terror issue. We have to end it, all right? This is very important uh, for Turkey, also for our national security. That does not undermine... Yeah. What, what you've actually done, if I may say so, with the policy you've adopted toward the Kurds in Syria is you've inflamed anger amongst your own Kurdish population to the point where I think in two dozen cities there have been street protests. We now see curfews in place. We see your military on the streets. We've seen more than 30 These people, are 30 the people are killed. 30 people mm -hmm. killed in the right. last few weeks. And what the mayor of Diabaka, for example, is saying is that this looks like a return to the bad old days of the conflict in the 1990s. Now, I think that would be too pessimistic uh, to reach such a conclusion. And I really do not understand the logic of focusing solely on Kobani. Kobani is a tragedy. Uh, Kobani is a symbol. That's what Kobani exactly, is. Right. And it's a symbol of a Turkish strategy which seems, again, I put it to you again, driven by your own narrow self-interest when it comes to your perception of a Kurdish problem rather than what you claim to be your view of Islamic State as a threat to the entire region and the world. I say it once again, and I will insist on it, that uh, ISIS is a clear and present threat to Turkish national security. And we will do whatever we can to use the uh, President Obama's terms to degrade and destroy uh, ISIS. If you really believe that, then, let's, let's turn a corner. If you really believe that, are you prepared to acknowledge to me that over the last three years, Turkey has made some fundamental mistakes in trying to work with the Islamist extremists? Look, uh, this is another, uh, I have to say, uh, misleading argument uh, that's been in circulation uh, for quite a considerable period of time, uh, which I would not agree. Starting in 2011, we have consistently informed our allies and partners that if we do nothing about the uh, regime in Syria, in Damascus, then that, that's bound to radicalize the region. And this is exactly what's happening. We have been saying this. Back in 2011, the number of uh, this Al-Qaeda or ISIS-type terrorists, uh, it was in hundreds, like 400, 500 people. Within a matter of two or three years, the number has increased uh, almost like 30,000 people now. Uh, of okay. course it has. And you know where they've come from? They've come through Turkey. Look, and they have, they have personnel and military equipment going through your country. They call it the jihadist highway into Syria and Iraq. And what we have seen is that the Americans, for example, 
have lost patience over the last three years with Turkey's inability to stop that flow of support material going to the extremists. Now, there are these people, some of them, uh, who went to Syria, uh, they have come to Turkey uh, with their passports, okay? So what's happened is that we made a clarion call uh, to those people concerned in the security and intelligence fields to share information as to the suspected people uh, who are traveling to Turkey. And in the last uh, six months, uh, 52,000 people had been apprehended. The uh, uh, no-entry list uh, has been expanded. It's almost like 7,000 people. Uh, more than 1,000, 1,020, I think, people uh, are deported. Turkey has uh, taken uh, draconian measures to cut down uh, this free travel. Yes, uh, apparently um, your president Erdogan told Joe Biden in a private conversation, which was then reported by Joe Biden, he said, we did let too many people through and now we're trying to seal the border. So it's an acknowledgement but, but that you got things Joe wrong. But then Joe Biden uh, apologized, I think, yeah, for, because for he, what he, he said. <laughs> he regretted uh, being so public about it, but the point remains. The point, but let, again, I mean, let me uh, ask you one question. If, for instance, UK authorities or French authorities, if they do not inform their counterparts in Turkey about those people, if they don't share information or intelligence with their Turkish counterparts, how will you, uh, uh, you know, ban the travel of those people to Turkey? Then you would be challenging the uh, freedom of travel. And, and, and Just one fun- specific point about right. that. You say, look, it's not our fault. These militants are being allowed to travel by their Western governments. Western governments were very concerned recently when you appeared to do a deal with IS to return, to get the return of more than 40 Turkish citizens who had been abducted in Mosul. Finally, they were that's freed. That's our diplomatic staff. Sorry? Yes, that's right. right. And finally, they were freed. And the Turkish press and the international press have both been reporting that more than 100 IS suspects were released as part of this deal, including foreign nationals, including, we are led to believe, two Britons and a Dane who was wanted for murder back in Denmark. And the Danish foreign minister is now furious that Turkey didn't inform Denmark of the release of this suspect. Both the United Kingdom and Denmark are having uh, consultations with our authorities. Uh, I haven't uh, seen the results of this, and I don't have the details. Why did you release those people? Look, I mean, I'm not in a position uh, to confirm that these people have been released. Uh, I haven't said anything to that effect. But what I know is that on that particular issue, there are consultations, ongoing consultations between Turkey and the United Kingdom at the highest levels and between Turkey and Denmark. And we are ready to share our information and our intelligence with our allied uh, uh, you know, uh, partners and allied counterparts. So uh, it, it, this is being addressed, by the way. I mean, this is being addressed, and this is It's important. a problem, isn't it? I mean, you sit here and you talk to your colleagues here at NATO, and you know that Western governments right now are extremely worried about the stance being taken by Turkey. Do you accept that? Well, why are you worried about it? Well, for it, let's take one more specific. In Chilik Air Base, just a few days ago, the Americans believed there was an agreement that would allow them to use their warplanes on missions against Islamic State militants from Inchilic Air Base. It now turns out there is no such agreement. But your underlying assumption is that there are no consultations between Turkey and the United States for further uh, Turkish uh, support uh, to, to the fight no, against ISIS. I'm simply ISIS. telling you that days ago, Susan Rice, the U.S. National Security Advisor, told the media that now... Turkish bases, including Inchilik, were available for use by the Americans. But it now turns out that when it comes to bombing missions against IS, you are not allowing the Americans to use Inchilik, or have you changed policy? First of all, uh, for all these uh, humanitarian missions, overflight permissions are granted immediately. I'm, I'm talking secondly, about using warplanes secondly, from Inchilik Air Base. Can right. the Americans do it or I'll not? I'll respond to that. We are working on a strategy with our American allies, including our American allies, as to what could Turkey could possibly do in the face of, uh, face of this uh, big uh, threat. So your underlying assumption is that Turkey is not consulting on these issues uh, with the allied countries. It's the opposite. No, my underlying assumption is that there is a military coalition, a front, a military front, which has been set up to try to degrade and then destroy Islamic State, or whatever you choose to call it. Those were the words of Obama. Right. Turkey's not on board. That's what I'm saying. We are. Look, 
I think we should end this uh, blame game because we are working on a strategy with our allies on what to do in the short to long term. And uh, they th keep asking you to deliver things which you simply fail to deliver. But I'm telling you that we are working on a strategy. And but this how strat long is it going to take? Look at the swathes of territory that Islamic State already occupies in Syria and Iraq. Look at what is happening in towns like Kobani. You say, oh, there's a diplomatic process going on. How many weeks and months are you going to string I, I, this I, I'm out? I'm sure that, I'm sure that uh, there will be a, a, a deal among all the allies uh, as to what uh, to do further, uh, as to what further to do in Syria and Iraq. What we have been saying is that, first and foremost, aerial bombings, and we support them, uh, and that they should continue without any pause. And that's been said very clearly by our highest... Uh, but not from your air base which is uh, 500 kilometers from the target zone when they have to use air bases, which are more than 1,000 kilometers look, from the target zone. Aerial bombings uh, cannot be the sole recipe oh. uh, to address uh, this uh, threat emanating from ISIS. We need areas within S Syria where we can train and equip these people, local peoples who would fight against uh, ISIS. And that must be protected uh, from the air supported by regional countries and reinforced by the international community. A, a final thought, Ambassador, and you've laid out there what you say must be a coordinated approach, a, a regional approach, and it strikes me as interesting that over my many years going to Turkey and talking to Turkish politicians, there's been a great ambition for Turkey to be a really powerful, dominant regional player, embedded in NATO and the West, but also able to reach out to the east. Would you accept that in recent years, Turkey's image as a reliable partner in the west and Turkey's ability to deliver to the east have both suffered terrible setbacks? Well, I would even uh, uh, argue uh, against that. See, we have been together with our allies uh, in Afghanistan, we are participating in many NATO operations, and we are doing visible and concrete contributions to all uh, allied operations. Turkey is an allied country. There is no doubt about it. We have been part of NATO since 1952. We are aware of our uh, commitments within NATO, and we shall never you know, undermine our efforts or reduce our efforts in, in, in case of this alliance. And that's in the track records of the alliance, and we will continue to do the same thing. All right. Well, we have to end there. But Ambassador Jelan, I want to thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I do appreciate it.